All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to class five, the power of brushwork session on sky and trees. It's um, already time to start signing up for session two, rocks and water, if you would like to. I think so far we only have two people signed up. So there's some space available. Donna's in there. All right. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to start this class kind of in a reverse order. We've been doing a lot of um, demos and a lot of uh, watching me paint. So I definitely want to celebrate you guys, look at your work. And it is so cool to see what you guys are sharing and all the comments and feedback that you're giving to each other. So we're going to go ahead and jump over there uh, just in a second. Today's class is about um, just the form of trees, the shape of trees and sky holes. And to me, sky holes are the most fun part of painting almost. I say that about everything, but I really think that people have such a good time carving into their big shapes and getting these little detail elements that really can make the painting sing. So we're gonna be talking about that today. Um, Going forward, this is class five of seven, we are pretty much, I don't want to say done learning, but now we're going to start working on our final project. I will pick a subject or a painting that I will be doing, and you're more than welcome to paint along with me, but I also urge you guys to think about, you know, what is a painting that has trees and sky in it? that I've been wanting to paint or something that's inspired me lately. It can be a copy of a master's painting or another painting. Um, it can be from your own references. It can be from any of my references. Uh, we were just talking to Lisa before class started and she's kind of got one of my paintings that she would like to um, base a painting on. And that's completely fine. That's fantastic. Um, so whatever it is you want to do, I'm just hoping that it involves sky and trees. If it's a you know, a bunch of kittens or something. It might be a little bit weird, but, you know. Um, so let's over. Oh, does anybody have any questions about the handout as I jump over to the, um, to our Padlet page to take a look at your guys' work? And I can't remember, did we decide pinning or spotlighting is better? So this is spotlight. Does everybody see me as kind of the main screen? See you, yes, yes. All right, perfect. I'm gonna do share screen. And pop over to our Padlet. All right, everybody sees our awesome little glass space here, our Padlet page. Mm -hmm. And oh, here's my big news for the week, besides hopefully getting my bed back, is uh Sharon Hadley has figured out how to post to our Padlet page. So that Very was good. Huge for me. Yeah, that really uh, well, Linda made me happy. I saw a whole bunch of little practices where you posted screenshots <laughs> of your thing. I deleted all those for you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, but good job. And that's just it. Like, even if you're not sure, just, you know, keep trying. And that's what happened is I saw three or four different attempts from you, Sharon. And then he finally figured it out. And that's how we figure out painting. That's how we figure out technology. You know, you're not going to break anything. You did amazing. And I'm so proud of you for sticking with it, figuring it out while Ty is, you know, not home. So great job. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I may, I'm, I'm, I may uh, contact you later in order to figure out how to do it, since I'm still not able to get on Padlet. Oh, no. Who's that? I, I'm sorry. I don't that's, get to speak. That's it's Martha. Martha, Martha Couch. Oh. All right. Well, feel free to give me a call too. Okay. Yeah, my phone number is at the bottom of all the emails I send out to you guys. So I'll have a uh, I have a a meeting after class, but if you want to call me in the afternoon, that would be great. Great. Thank you. All right. Great. All right. Um. So here we go to our Padlet page. We've got our videos from last week, you know, out of mixed greens. I went ahead and posted um, Linda's photo that I did the last little quick demo from. Um, that was a ton of fun. 
um, online links. I went ahead and put a link to the next class for those of you who would like to keep learning and studying with me and keeping this community going. I hope that's all of you, but I understand as we get closer to summer and things get busy. Oh, on that note, um, I literally have like three days to turn in a prospectus for a uh, summer class. I do not normally teach during the summer, uh, just because that's kind of my opportunity to get outdoors and paint plein air and, you know, go paint in breweries and coffee shops and everything else. So uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to see if there was a lot of interest to do a class, even if it was maybe like a four week condensed focus or something like that this summer, or are you guys all going to be as busy as I am? So I've got a couple of trips, some camping, you know, my daughter will be home. It um, depends when really, it's scheduled. What's that? Depends when it's scheduled. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does anybody, would everybody understand if I don't teach through the summer and then we'll just meet up together? Yes, in the, um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. All right, great. I've only taught once during the summer, and it was fun, but it definitely, you know, seemed like those were always the prettiest days outdoors and everything else. Um, so, I, okay, great. I'm not going to teach this summer. We'll meet back up in um, in uh, September or something uh, for a yeah. fall class, and I think I might jump back to doing a focus on tonalism and design again, because I really enjoy teaching that. Um, and I think, you know, even somebody like Gail, uh, yeah. who's so good at it, um, can uh, still learn so much. And I just think that by focusing on tonalism, we're taking some of the color, you know, there'll be some com color to it, but we can take some of that element away and really focus on balance, design, rhythm, all the things that are actually more important than color and painting. Um, so hopefully you guys uh, are okay with that and think that's a good idea. Okay, yeah, so yeah. the handout this week, go ahead. I heard somebody say something. So for this week's handout, I just kind of gave a quick synopsis of all of the elements of drawing or painting a tree. And then below that, so if you guys were, you know, willing to read a whole page and then a little more, I literally go into the detail of actually making sky holes and making them count. Um, at the bottom of that, I did put a reference. It's a painting that I've done before in class. Um, this is just right over the hill from where I live. Mm -hmm. The little bird sanctuary, and I just like this these negative shapes. But I actually think I found a different reference I wouldn't mind doing that has a little more uh, variety of tree shapes because these are all kind of the umbrella um, shapes. So, but this is a great one for learning sky holes. It's I don't want to say basic because there's a lot of information, but it's kind of nice. It's quite forgiving. I painted this scene. A number of times just because again it's so close i can wake up and go paint there at sunrise i know it's going to be beautiful even in the rain it's beautiful um and i know i'll also be by myself besides one or two people walking by with binoculars to go look for cool birds um see the fog in the background that's where it gets really marshy and wet and then to my left is the creek that i painted a number of times in different classes so it's just a really easy to get to spot for me I think it's important that we find, especially for those of you who want to get into painting outdoors, is we don't want to waste too much time trying to think of where can I go each morning or each evening or whenever you want to get out and paint. So I have about four spots that are all within about 15 minutes of my house. Um, I admit that I live in a very beautiful area. It is suburbia, so I have to drive, you know, to, to get out of suburbia, except for actually Two of my spots are right in the middle of town. I just don't put Costco in the paintings. Um, and uh, But it's really nice to find some interesting things that um, you can go and paint. And I think it's really, really important for those of us who are interested in painting um, landscapes long term to revisit a location multiple times through the year. 
to watch the seasons, to watch the weather, to watch the times of day. If you're constantly in a new location and constantly with new information, it's hard to take in. So like you can tell that the sun is rising uh, behind these trees off to the left. It's hitting the left, you know, the left sides of these trees. The light is beginning to rake through. Um, it's an overcast morning, so we have this kind of soft light. And this one really works with that three value or four value system that we were talking about with the sky being the lightest, the lands being the second light, uh, lightest. If there was hills that you could see, it's just foggy enough. Mount Hood's actually back there. Um, can't see it. And then the upright trees, you can really see how dark they are um, with the shaft, with the light behind them. So uh, anyways, I think it's really a great way to learn is to revisit. You know, you have to ignore people like my wife who are like, oh, you went and painted that tree again? Yes, I did. <laughs> but uh, I'm still learning and I'm still focusing on different aspects of it. Um, so anyways, any questions on the handout? Not yet. No? no. Okay. Um, Very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. I'm going to move this one up. So this is my older, this is from when Anton Pavlenko and I taught a class together. Um, this is just some good basic information on painting trees. One of the most important or two most important parts about this is that trees strive to be balanced. Even when I'm painting these really um, kind of bonsai style coastal trees that I like painting lately, you'll notice that, you know, even if the tree is really twisting and turning and moving and being pushed by the wind, that it will try to counterbalance itself with its branches or its canopy. So constantly looking for that. Look for the counterbalance um, in odd shaped trees. Um, also, yeah, just watch how, like, if a branch gets pushed, the foliage will all of a sudden go the other direction. Again, it's just, it's just like us. When we start to teeter or start to fall down, all of a sudden we'll throw our weight the other direction. Um, and then the other thing is this top one here. Notice how the trunk and branches taper from the ground. Trunk and branches will usually get lighter in value and less saturated in color as they taper off. This is one of the most important things to capture when painting a tree. You guys know what I mean when I say taper, like get thinner? Yeah, you're so right. Yeah. Just think of a trunk, you know, the, the very solid trunk, like a pine tree or any tree. And just think of at the base, for the most part, there's some weird, you know, billabob trees and odd, you know, trees that for some reason are in Australia always and stuff like that, where, um, but the trunk is generally, or where it connects to the earth, is oftentimes or mostly going to be the thickest part of the trunk. And then again, think about a pine tree and how it goes up all the way to the top to the point, and it tapers off or gets thinner as it goes up. The branches are generally also going to get thinner as they go further up, meaning like the heaviest branches are coming off the heaviest part of the trunk, right? And then each branch that goes off that trunk or off that big branch is going to get progressively thinner and thinner as it goes out. When things get thinner in painting, it means that more light can also wrap around them or affect them. So that's why oftentimes in our photos, our references, our, you know, when you're out looking at things, You'd be like, it's so interesting as the branch gets out towards the sun that the sun begins to envelop it and their colors begin to merge a little more, right? You notice that it gets a little more like that gossamer effect or that, um, yeah. So anyways, we're going to look for that. We'll talk about that today during the demo as well. One of the biggest, biggest giveaways for beginning landscape painters is that the branch ends and begins at the same width, right? The, right. You know, you're using a brush that makes a certain mark and that mark goes all the way through. It's important that we either use thinner brushes if that's what you need to do, or we turn our brush 
so that it starts a little wider and then gets a little thinner. Or the technique that I prefer is lifting the brush so that I will be pushing a little harder as I'm closer to, let's say, a branch coming off a bigger branch. That branch, I'll push a little harder so that a little more of the bristles are touching the canvas. And then I'm going to steadily lift my hand and therefore the brushes, the brush, the bristles, and have less mark on the canvas. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. It's yeah. also important yeah. that we uh, learn to drag the brush versus push the brush. When you want lighter marks, remember to drag and lift. If you remember on the second class of this, I talked about that the brush stroke itself has a beginning, a middle, and an end. If your brush strokes look like stamp marks, that means that you're just doing one motion, just dab, dab, dab. You want a beginning, a middle, and an end to each brush stroke. It's crazy making, right, Donna? I see your brain working right there. Um, and it's how much paint do we load? How much pressure do we apply? If we're using a brush that is more like a square shape, you can turn that brush as you lift it so you can start really thick and really wide and turn it slowly to make a narrower mark and lift it. If your brush is not making the marks you want, stop fighting that brush. Either sharpen it, like, you know, take it and rub it back and forth in the paint to make kind of a nice clean edge. Or simply just say, yeah, this brush isn't for this job. I used to really promote using basically flats in everything. And I used to really uh, recommend that artists or, you know, beginning artists use hog hair bristles only because it really teaches you to uh, learn that your pressure is, you know, as or more important than the brush you're using. But I don't do that anymore. Um, now I say use the tool that works for you. Use the tool that does the job. Um, just because I, I get tired of wrestling with, you know, inferior tools or incorrect tools. Um, but do know that with a decent flat brush that you can make a decent edge on it, mm -hmm. you can make thousands and thousands of different marks. There's a huge amount of calligraphy possible in that brush. So um, here, for those of you writing down, which looks like a bunch of you, your homework for this week, besides figuring out your final assignment that you want to paint, is to make a whole lot of brush marks. Last week was about mixing greens. This week, if you just showed me next week a page of all these different calligraphy, and we'll talk about that again later during the demo. It's so invaluable. So many of us want to learn and experiment on our important paintings, you know, our painting that we really want to work out, that we stop experimenting, we stop trying to make new marks. I, I would love it if you would go through like five or six or 10 of your different brushes and really see what they're capable of. Any questions there, you guys? No? Oh, man. That's this what is you the want. Easiest you, class want ever. you guys are too, uh, um, you guys are too easy today. All right. So, reference photos. Um, I put in a whole bunch, including the one that was on the handout. I put out a horizontal version of it. This was actually the one I was thinking about doing. And you guys could still talk me into it, but I have painted it in classes past. Um, anyways, this one I think is wonderful for those of you who really wanna learn about form and big full shapes. You can see the light really raking across from the left side. Now you can simplify this. I'm putting this stop sign, a head sign. Um, you know, you don't have to put in all the grasses, but if you wanted to use something like this, I think I added, oh yeah, this one, where it's the opposite. The light's coming from the right side. I don't like this because it creates three uh, repeating shapes here. Um, but for something, for some reason, I've kept this photo. I've never painted it, but I've kept this photo around uh, as something I would be excited about. One thing I think is really interesting is you guys see this dark shape 
which is presumably on the right side of the, you know, where the sun would be coming in. And it's because over off the screen, there's a big tree that's casting a shadow across and hitting it. So that, that kind of stuff can be confusing in a painting. So you may want to ignore that, or you may want to bring in like the edge of this tree possibly, or I don't know how you want to deal with it, but um, just so you're aware, this is one what of my favorite- What do you think that thing is in the middle? What, what? What's that lump in the middle? This? Right? Yeah. Uh, I where I live, uh, blackberry bushes take over okay. everything that stands still for more than 10 minutes. Mosquitoes okay. and blackberry bushes will get you. Um, I believe that's what it is. So yeah, I would totally, and in fact, in the references I want to use today, I always, you know, go through and ask all the questions. Like, I, that's what's it. This has got a beautiful color scheme. It's got interesting things, but I've never painted it because, yeah, this looks stupid. It looks like a big woolly mammoth taking a nap back here. Uh, this tree, like just reaching in. I always feel like when trees do this, it's um, like a photo bomb. You know, somebody poking their head in from the side of the camera. Uh, there's a lot of weirdness in this that I wouldn't paint. And again, the replication of form. And the weird thing is this destroys the idea of depth and space because the biggest ones are in the back and then they get smaller as they come forward. So there's a lot of things in this photo that I would want to question. Um, but I do love like the warms and cools, the warm light, cool light, all the different things going on. So anyways, if you paint this, beware the woolly mammoth, beware the photo bombing tree, <laughs> beware the reversal of uh, things in perspective. You know, it's great to say, okay, I can use elements of this. Like I love the colors. I love the pinks and light blues. I love the cool greens and warm greens, the reds, you know, near the greens, the uh, auburns or whatever you want to call these kind of brownie colors. Um, but yeah, it together doesn't make a good image. The ditch is even weird. Um, lots of stuff. Um, this is also a painting that I did really huge. I did a six foot version of this. Anybody want to uh, talk about this really quick and see what they like and what they don't like about this picture? I'm going to go ahead and ask you, Donna, since you uh, didn't raise your hand. <laughs> uh, which Donna? You, Donna. <laughs> well, the, the sun is almost right in the middle. Um, I would... I don't know. I'd almost think about cropping it somehow. Or um, I love the way the sun is coming through. Yeah, I I like it. I like the photo. Yeah, Michael, did you post something like this, sort of like this, recently? Um, I think right. you said it was an older painting. It is a little bit older, yeah. It pops up from time to time. I'm trying to figure out what year I actually painted it, um, looking back through my photos. Um, but yeah, this is a uh, place we used to camp um, when we set up a whole tent village with a whole bunch of families. We call it the play group because all of us had kids within a couple months of each other. And uh, Sometimes there's up to 50 people, um, all with kids, and they've all grown up together, and it's been wonderful. Um, and, and I would see this all the time. This is literally the view from our, our tent at sunset. And I constantly wanted to paint it, um, but it's uh, got some interesting things. Donna is perfectly right. This is very centered, right? It, yeah. um, also, this shape of this bush here always bothered me. It's very heavy and kind of breaks up the scene. Um, so constantly questioning. Also, I love this old fence, yeah. but then it gets completely lost in this, uh, what is this called? Ragweed or uh, brush? I can't remember it. Um, it's kind of an invasive species here. In Oregon. Scotch broom. What is it? Scotch broom. Scotch broom, yeah. Beautiful, but it's uh, really invasive here. Um, but I still painted it, I think. Um, 
And uh, yeah, the main thing was I love the light coming around and enveloping here. And you could see how the light, especially on a slightly atmospheric or hazy day, how light really can hug things. It doesn't just come, you know, dark. It literally begins to wrap around objects. And that is one of my favorite parts about living in the Pacific Northwest is that atmosphere that we get to see and how it affects life. Um, and I really do think of it, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, I do like to think of it as the light literally reaching around and giving a hug to the different objects. Um, and as they get closer, you can see the light just catching the edge here. Um, I am having a hard time finding my painting of it. Um, I may have to just post it later. Oh, here it is. Okay, here. Yes, that's the one I saw online. So yeah, that is that, is that is just beautiful compared to the reference photo. Photo. Oh, yeah. oh, good. Thank you. But you can see, yeah, I was inspired by it. Um, I you know brought the fence back into the foreground a little bit. I actually did change the Scotch broom. It looks like to some purples. Um, I don't know what those would be. Maybe uh, lupin beans or lupin. There you go, I like lupin. Um, I don't know if it grows the coast too much, but uh, anyways, you can see that I went through and modified trying to make things. It looks like I did keep the sun in the middle a little more than maybe I should have. Don't tell the people that bought it. Um, and I also let that soft light wrap more around because the objects out here are actually quite dark. And this may be based slightly on a different photo. Um, so have a hard yeah. time making realistic tree trunks. Okay, here's a great, great trick for those of you who are having a hard time painting uh, tree trunks, is to go out and grab a couple branches. Branches are minor trees, right? They are still thin, you know, thinner as they go away from the, the trunk and thicker as they go down. You'll also see these little nodules that are in the trees, like where the trunk was going. They'll oftentimes get a little bit wider where the trunk is coming off. And I think that's a, you know, like I said, a counterbalance support. Um, here, over here, you'll see a really good example of that counterbalance that I was talking about. All the trunks are going to the left and what happens to the foliage? It goes off to the right to counterbalance it. You see that? Mm -hmm. And you see again how I just saw this big lump of a shape. And I basically just got rid of it and decided to bring in something that was kind of counterbalanced, like this one. And I wanted to have these diagonal lines in this painting, all leading us to, you know, the glory land, to the promised land, to the, you know, focal point. So anyways, we have a lot of references. Here's one from Italy of some amazing house. Oh, wow. Always wanted to paint this, but I've never quite figured out how to present it or what to do with it. It's quite busy, but I do like some of the shapes. You know, I might just have to get in there and mentally start cleaning it up. Maybe I don't like this straight, straight line of the path. Is um, that a garden in the back? It, the whole thing is this really amazing Garden. Garden, yeah. So this is the pond area, and you know, okay. You know me, I'm always in the water. <laughs> um, this is just a local library, <laughs> but I really love oak trees. I love that canopy shape. Um, and again, I apologize. I take so many backlit photos just because backlit is one of my favorite things. Um, this is another image that I've constantly wanted to paint and never have. Um. I really like this fall trees. This is one that, you know, out on the back roads and I just had to stop because I love this entryway, different things. Um, this is a spot I go and paint quite a bit. It's actually standing in lavender fields, but looking out, um, I don't really care about the lavender fields. I love the Vista and the old um, Italian style uh, winery back here. But I really like this, this shape and I thought there was a lot of nice negative shapes you could begin to look at here. You know, if you do this scene or something like it, just simplify this background. We don't need to spend 100 hours on this painting. Um, 
This is actually possibly kind of the reference I was thinking about doing because it's got a little more diversity of tree shapes and forms. And that's it. This would also be a good one for this week if you wanted to, you know, incorporate the greens with all the different tree shapes. There's a lot of different formations and different types of shrubbery trees, uh, edges, all these different things that make this interesting. That's one I'm trying to paint right now. <laughs> it's a tricky one. You're fighting off a lot there. So this is the one that I was thinking I would do today as my demo. Um, I want to show you guys, uh, can I ask, uh, did I do kind of a subtractive wiping away tree painting in this class or was that the previous class? Previous class. <laughs> Uh, All right, so I might do this kind of as one of my illuminated tones. I've already kind of thought of some changes I might want to do. Uh, would this be okay for you guys? It's kind of an example of how I would simplify trees and then begin to break them up a little bit. Yes. Yeah, yes. good idea. Great. And uh, I just really have always liked this photo I took. This is another one on the country road that I just stopped. And it just, uh, I just love the light and everything. So anybody wants to do something a little cleaner, a little, I'm not gonna say simple because it's got a house in it and stuff, but I always just thought this was really interesting showing the transparency where the leaves are a little more spread out and then the transparency and density and then the full density. And then this tree is catching the light. The light's behind, right behind here. So these two look more backlit. You can see the reflected light coming underneath the, uh, the, underneath the roof of the house and back in here. And then the trees over here are more side lit. So anyways, this is a someday, someday I'll figure out what to do with this painting, but I haven't yet, or photo. And this was the other one I was thinking about doing today, um, but I didn't like the fact that the, it's, the, this whole middle area is all in cast shadow. Um, I thought that I could show you guys, because again, I don't like this shape. It's just a big random clump. Uh, I think that there's a small tree here, bush or tree, in front yeah. of this tree and makes kind of a weird formation. And then my least favorite part is look at the top of this tree here and the trees behind it and how it's a perfect, perfect um, tangent. So I would definitely be taking this tree up over the top of that. So I thought I might use this one as my example and just show you how I what I would do because I like a lot of it. I like the movement of the creek. I love the backlit tree or the trees in the background that are lit. Um, so how would I go about using something like this but modifying the elements that I don't like? Um, so that's what I may do is even combine the two, this one and this one. Um, anyways. I've still, got, I've still got a half hour to just <laughs> um, painting examples. I didn't add a whole lot more this week. Um, there's a couple that are I actually just moved over. Um, for those of you who would like to look at other artists, different ways of painting trees and shapes. Um, this one by Anton Pavlenko is a really good example of really strong big negative shapes and then where his littler negative shapes or sky holes, um, they get a little darker and duller and not as pronounced. Um, but I really like the movement and the poetry in these trees. And then just really strong backlit. All righty. I didn't add any of my own pictures this week. Cheryl, it looks like you've come a long way with your painting. Well, it's about halfway, I think. Yeah. There are going to be colors. there are going to be um, grasses and stuff in the foreground from up where you're standing, and I there should be a tree on the left, but Ooh. I'm trying to decide how to how to bring it in and how big it ought to be. The yeah. one in the photograph is smaller because it's further down the hill, but I could bring it up and then make it bigger and have it break that mountain plain in the back. Okay, so that'll be interesting. So 
you're not going to show the actual ground that we're standing on. So it does look not, like we're up. No, up it's just down. right. We're we're up on an overlook. Uh, but the there's some grasses in the front, and actually there's a couple of day lilies up there in the, in the picture. So okay, I have, that can be that can be tricky. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Where mm -hmm. you you may want to bring a little bit of the ground form in, possibly. Um, just having things stick up because right now we're kind of an aerial view. Again, we're looking down from the top of a hill. Um, and just having a couple things popping up, I'd be curious. I'll be curious how it works because it could still look like we're floating or like these grasses are just so tall <laughs> that they're yeah. coming from the valley down below. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of my very first instructors I ever had was like, you have to show the, you know, and I always scoff when anybody says have to do anything in painting or art. <laughs> but, um, you know, but he was really adamant that if it's an aerial view, it either has to be from a plane or, you know, like you're flying or floating. And right, purposeful. right. Or you need to show kind of where we're standing. Otherwise, it feels like kind of that uncomfortable in between. So, you know, whether or not I fully agree with that, I do think about that. Okay. You know, kind of um, I do have some, you know, tr yeah big vistas and then a tree coming up and through it. If you make the tree too small, then it's kind of in a mid ground, not in the foreground. So you yeah, have yeah. to bring it all the way up and through. Um, yeah, so that, that can be a tricky one. I'm gonna um, keep working on it. The other thing is there are houses all along those roads. Yeah, and here's I, an example where- I, I don't know whether to leave them out or not. Okay, yeah, here's an example where I did that. It, you can see it almost feels a little bit uncomfortable just yeah. having this tree. Here's another example where I put a little more of the foreground, but brought the tree all the way to the foreground. Um, and then here's one of mine that I think is the least successful. I actually painted over this one. Um, I just didn't like the shape of the tree that I made. But, um, you know, having a little bit of a foreground. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. None of those are really successful. This one's probably the best. Um, well, then there are can be done. Yeah. There's no ground there, so yeah. yeah. Let me play yeah. with it and see how it goes. And I don't know about putting little houses in. I hinted at a few, and there's some along the road up here, but. Yeah, I think that's nearly enough. Okay, well, that's what I thought, but there are, there are a whole lot more. That's why. Yeah. Um, I guess I could ask others. Do you guys think that having just a couple, because they almost become kind of the focal point, and it's a good spot for a focal mm -hmm. point. It's kind of like you move through it, you get kind of a little bit of a you know a reward, and then you kind of move back through. Like this painting does a good job, even though it's this long horizontal panoramic view, you still get the eye to move really nicely through it. Um, and even this little glimpse of, I, I'm going to guess, water back there. That's here. the river. That's. Yeah. that That's enough. Like, it kind of counterbalances it in this way. Like, we're definitely going to look in this area much more than over here. But it kind of drags us over, pulls us over, and then there's a little bit of a reward. Right. And then back we go. Yeah. And nice job kind of linking your clouds and making Thank them you. not look like they're you know, kind of pushing each other around or fighting for space. Yeah, anybody have anything to add here? I love the way the mountains are done and uh, that you can see such depth there. Yeah, really. Great. Beautiful. You can wow. see mountains forever. And after a while, they turn, you can't figure out if it's the mountain or the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I really love when that happens. Yeah, that's some of my favorite stuff, too, is when edges, like, you can barely, barely see the top of this hill back here, and then it fully dissipates. Like, it looks like this cloud kind of comes down in front of it. I love that. Yeah, nice job. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. I think the buildings add depth to it mm -hmm. and, um, and dimension because without them, 
it wouldn't be real clear on on the size of everything i think yeah yeah it okay. would be much more abstract wouldn't it yeah yeah mm -hmm. nice job thank I, you i like the few uh, you could add a couple more a couple more what <laughs> buildings You'd like a couple oh. more? Oh, you would like to see a couple more. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's kind of hinted at some down here on the road, but I hadn't decided if I was going to leave them there or not. They literally look like they're on the road. Well, they are, kind of. <laughs> I need to bring the road. I'll down. bring the road around a little different. Yeah, because that's a dangerous place to live. <laughs> <laughs> my, eye, my eye goes immediately to the three buildings you have right here where Michael is. And then I look over to the left and that white space in the back and I see another something, a couple of buildings right in there, Michael. Yeah. They would be super teeny tiny. Yeah. yeah, they'd have to be tiny, tiny. Anyways, well, I'll, nice see, job. I'll see how the tree branch goes. If a yeah. tree branch is gonna come in there from the lower left or not. And squint your eyes at it, you guys. And you've done such a nice job. I mean, all the greens are subtle and they're all grayed down, but they really do recede back the space so nicely. And I know that's something you've kind of battled with a little bit in the past. Yeah. I think you're really, you're really getting, you know, a little yellower and then they get redder and then they get bluer as they go back and um, nicely played. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, Diane Lewis. Do you have anything you'd like us to discuss as we talk about this? Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi. Let's see. I thought, uh, well, I thought I published a painting I was working on, but maybe not because palette, nope, that was, um, nope, it would be on top. So I guess I didn't get it. I thought I did. It's all, all right. right. Well, we'll see I'm, if it pops up in somebody else's section. I know that yeah. they're trying to organize a couple people had put things in um but basically it's a painting i did in the previous class that um the comment you frequently made is it looks like watercolor <laughs> so um i'm reworking it and i'll put it back on but basically i'm not looking at the photograph which is a huge deal for me that um <laughs> to <laughs> just work on the painting um using the concepts that i've been trying to learn in your class so um I feel like it's a growing experience. Um, no, so good. that's what I'll say. And this, is, this is nice though, because I can see the density. You're, you're actually, you know, you're not adding so much water to your paint because it's acrylic, right? Yes. Yeah, so you're not adding so much water. You know, again, when even when I'm doing, you know, acrylic washes, I'm using about as much or as least amount of water as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, not me. So I know that that's something you've been battling with, and I think, yeah. or, you know, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, it's something yeah. that you're working on, um, yeah. is to let it look like paint, not watercolor, yeah. but dense, you know, chroma-filled opacity. Yeah. Um, and you're doing a good job on these. I think, you know, these little exercises were really good for a lot of us, myself yeah. included. And it would be something I would never do on my own. <laughs> and now you know the joy of painting sexy pears. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sexy bushes and awesome clouds. There you go. There you go. Thank you. All right. Uh, Don, is Don here? Not sure I saw Don popping in. So, Don, if you get a chance to watch this, this is fantastic. Fabulous. Um, I really appreciate, and I would actually like to spend some time myself doing more of a breakdown because I did these lines and then you broke it down further into all these other experiments. Um, so great to take, you know, a little extra time. I know, you know, we all have limited painting time and creative time and we just want to get to the fun part and make sexy pairs or whatever it is. And, but it can be so useful to learn what our colors do with, you know, trans, you know, opacity to transparency with color different color mixes um and it's just something that we rarely again myself included in this rarely take the time to do 
Um, but it's so useful having this information both in our brain and then on a little sheet of you know paper or cardboard or whatever that we can refer to from time to time um, just to make sure we're using the right color. So great job, Don. Looks like you're getting a lot of really yeah. great comments over here. I really appreciate you guys going through and looking at each other's work. And uh, you guys have been busy. Look at all these nice comments. Um, and nice job, Don. Um, I, I, yeah, I've seen so much growth in Don's work over the last couple classes. That's and uh, really appreciate it. All right, Donna Goldstein, how are you doing? Okay, how are you? Doing well. 14 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to turn it in at the last minute there. Okay, tell us a little bit about what you got going on here. It looks like maybe it got a little washed out with the light and stuff, but I think it, we can understand here. It did get washed out. I used an old painting. I just painted over it with the blue, which is the blue sky. And then I went back in and, and tried to add colorful clouds. And then I and then I put the mountain in the back and I started doing different kinds of trees and bushes and stuff. And I was trying to do a stone wall going, you know, from one side to the other up the hill. But that didn't work out real well. But I also know that now I need to go back with my greens and do a lot of lighter tonal type colors to really bring out what's there already um yeah your sky is gorgeous i mean that oh. almost looks like photo realism like when i squint my eyes that looks like what i've been seeing the last couple of evenings with the mm -hmm. transparent clouds and the more opaque clouds um it looks like they're facelit which is just beautiful like the sun's kind of behind us and then everything in the bottom is kind of more in the shadow right. a little bit um yep a lovely piece um if mm -hmm. i were to dissect it a little bit um you have mm -hmm. this repeating line you got this line yeah. here line here line here line here and this line here so the bottom gets redundant or repetitive and a mm -hmm. little bit boring I would, I would actually like to see like maybe this lighter color chopping in and creating a counter angle that because all of this is just leading us in and out of the scene over and over and over Mm -hmm. uh, something to kind of bring us back in a little bit and that's just more of a design or composition element um and then you said you wanted to build a rock wall going up the hill um mm -hmm. you know rock walls are gorgeous and beautiful but i am also hesitant uh with a lot of my students to let them or, or to um you know a big wall or a fence all of a sudden the painting becomes much less inviting mm -hmm. right. right it's saying look but don't enter Right. right. We, it, stops we people, you. It, stops you. it does. It stops you. We want people to feel free to enter our painting, to get in there, walk around, look mm -hmm. around, explore. And that's why, like, the little houses and stuff that were in the previous painting are so great is because we give them a, a reward. Like, come on in, you know, the water's fine, look around, and oh, look at this beautiful clouds, and look at this beautiful clouds. So all the rewards right now are in the top of your painting, in my opinion. This is definitely the focal point. Yep. And this feels like I am an invader. Like I have to crawl over this stuff. I have to break into this painting to get in there and wander around. Yep. Um, you know, some of us, you know, myself, Linda, a couple others, we overdo sometimes the invite in. You know, we really make a clean, clean, clean path or a creek or whatever else. It doesn't have to be super obvious. If you simply took this dark line here mm -hmm. and yeah. raised it up at a slight angle and brought this light up just a little bit by breaking it and then did a little bit of a break here. So there's a path that's even imagined. You don't have to show the whole path. Like, oh, we're going to sneak around these bushes and then we're going to go back through here. We're going to travel back. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. An implied line. Can be all you need. Um, that's something that again, Linda, I keep picking on you, but it's a, because I'm working on the same thing. It's I feel like sometimes I'm just too obvious or too welcoming. <laughs> it's like having a ten foot welcome mat in front of my door versus you know <laughs> saying yeah, come on in. You know you might have to work for a little bit, but you can get back there. Um, and uh, so yeah, nice job, beautiful sky, really. And 
I love this, you know, uh, softer edges at the tops of these trees, these interesting marks. You're really doing a lot of interesting things, Donna. I, again, just like I said with Don, this is for all the D people, evidently, I can really see a lot of growth and a lot of um, bravery, I guess. Uh, I, I can already see things uh, changing in your paintings. And I really appreciate the bravery that that takes and the experimentation. It's a killer <laughs> sky. It's a killer oh, sky. The sky is ridiculous. I, I so have a question, please. please. Uh, the picture that is posted, how yeah. does the color on that compare to what you think? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's a little darker. The painting is darker. The painting is darker, but it yep. doesn't have more color, color, light. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to explain what I'm saying, but it, it feels like your camera made it duller. Yeah, it did. It did okay. to some degree, but I, it's because I need to work on those greens, oh, you know, yes. pull in different kinds of green, mm -hmm. more different kinds of greens and, you know, do some stuff in the front there particularly. Yeah. Green yeah, is the state of my the glare washes out the yeah. uh, contrast. I try. I can't get a decent, I cannot take a decent picture of my work with my it's eyes. so alive. hard. <laughs> I take, for every picture you see of anything I share online, I take like 20 photos from different angles. I'm constantly straightening them out. I'm constantly turning lights on and off, moving the painting around my house, trying to find, you know, because depending on the time of the day, a whole different area of my house, it's, ridiculous the best time to take a photo if you live at, you know anywhere near where i live is on an overcast day you, you just get this nice flat light i will literally rush you know run out with like 20 paintings and throw them in the backyard and take a whole bunch of photos um and even then i'm still fighting the glare mm -hmm. a lot of times what i have to do donna is take my photo at a slight angle like looking at the screen and seeing to where the glare goes away. And then I have to straighten the photo. And even then sometimes I have to go in and edit the photo a little bit, pushing the contrast up or, you know what I mean, or pulling the chroma up or whatever it is. So yeah, shooting art is a real art form and a real hassle. That's, I mean, I, again, I pay up to $75 per photo for my art to be photograph professionally yeah. I don't do it with very many of them just the bigger ones that I want to make prints of and stuff or I know is going to go into a promotional campaign or you know or a gallery where they want to use it in an advertisement or something um mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. it is ass so I get it we all get it we've all pressed. Michael also north light is a good if you have a side of the house that's facing the north just make you like I'll use the windows in the front of my house to put my paintings in and uh, it's north light in the shade and and uh, there's no reflection on it. Good. Oh. Yeah, yeah. North light yeah. is uh, a non-direct light and it changes the least. So I think I heard you guys talking about it when I was kind of setting up for class today that um, uh, asking why north light is so good for studio lighting, which is so funny because I have east west and south light in my studio no north light um <laughs> but you know it's because it's a bedroom converted into a studio um but when i build my studio it'll be mostly north light. Mm. but when, when you paint day. you paint with an artificial light right yeah 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 always yeah but even with that artificial light it's so filled with glare but the reason why uh, artists that build their own studios and have that kind of control um, will have north light is because it's not directly hitting and it changes the least. Um, you know, if you can imagine if it was east light, you'd have this huge amount of light coming in for an east facing window. You have this huge amount of sunrise light. Um, my biggest window in my studio is west facing. And you've probably even seen it in some of the videos that are in fast forward where all of a sudden this big ray of light will all of a sudden shoot across the painting. And that's just, you know, the sun has made its way around. And um, yeah, it's a bummer because I want to watch the sunset. But a lot of times I just can't paint with that because it's a complete change in color as well. Because sunset light is warm. 
and we'll just change everything I'm seeing completely. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it is tricky. Yeah. Um, Donna, this is the same from 10 days ago. Still beautiful. It didn't change my mind. Great job. Yeah. I um I had company last week, so no, no, we already know it was a pedicure. We get it. Yep. <laughs> That's cool. Uh good. Yeah. And yeah, I I great job. And yeah, family and friends, as wonderful as they are, they definitely get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh good job. I can't wait to see what you do for your final assignment. Uh hopefully you've begun to think about that. And Gail, I know I set you some They're good gorgeous. challenges here, Gail. Um, yep. Uh, those were last one. Did you do any changes to this? I did not do anything with those. I just okay, made it for new ones. Which of these would you prefer we look at? Well, it doesn't matter. Um, you just want me to use different greens and different... Um, all side lit different trees so i did an oak that's an oak and a maple and then below is a pine tree and a birch tree so um, oh, i like that nice that pine pine is beautiful. dark moody backgrounds i mean that is just this is gorgeous this is such a neat painting and i i, I really you know i always say you know don't center things don't do this and that but what happens when you do is it just becomes an icon Right, we think of the re religious icons of Mary and baby Jesus or whoever, and you know it's just perfectly centered, and you kind of got this uh, strong contrast around them, and that's what I often think about when people just do. It's almost like a portrait, right? Or they're tree portraits. Exactly, <laughs> it is. Yeah, and that's so neat. Tell us a little bit about the uh, joys and agony of this assignment. Um. Well, I learned a lot, and um, the oak tree and the maple tree, you know, I did, I wiped out all the highlights. Um, I went in and, and used the wipeout method and then went back in and softened them, but um, it was a lot easier to do the highlights um, and get a pop when I was wiping them out. And um, one thing that I learned is, it, or discovered is when I was painting these single trees, and I anchored them, put the shadow in, it was like the whole thing came alive. So, um, and I tried to be really loose and organic with what I was doing and kind of let the brush strokes and the wiping away kind of define the groupings or the, you know, I guess it is the major shapes of the leaves. And that was a lot of fun, just kind of discovering where those popped up and then bringing them out or knocking them back. So I really enjoyed it. The one that I struggled with the most is the birch trees down below because they were, they're far more lacy. Um, you know, the, the groupings of leaves were not as dense as they are on an oak tree or a maple tree, certainly not on a pine tree. So um, there were a lot more sky holes. And like I said, the leaves groupings were a lot more lacy. Um, so I struggled with that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's always a struggle. I, I, I have a quick question for you, just mm -hmm. clarify my memory of your paintings from previous to now. Um, I don't remember you putting on really thick no. textural paint in your older paintings. Um, mm -hmm. no. I think that, that, you know, whether or not this painting is as successful as you want it, but I, I really think that um, having that wipe away as well as this extra tool of adding the more textural paint, I think is really gonna open up a lot of potential in your paintings, because th this is all thin, yes. which is wonderful and nice. And I, I mean, this top painting, I really like it. I love this branches. I love so much of the form and the structure. You can really see, I mean, who doesn't wanna take a nap under here on a hot day, right? I mean, it's <laughs> really nice. Um, but I'm hoping that you are um, learning that there's times for uh, some density too. And what I'm finding, and maybe this is just a mental thing, is um, you know, as a full professional trying to make money, and you know, I don't try to, I try not to worry too much about AI. 
and you know digital this and that um, about all of that but i kind of think like oh one of the things we still have as artists going forward is that we can make it look like a paint mm -hmm. that means adding paint and if you know my work which you know i know you do i can be very thin so often and so i'm just beginning to just keep reminding myself there's got to be time you can add some texture some paint um, and, uh, so this is a really neat example of that. Um, so I, I just, I, again, I'm just thinking of, okay, as AI art becomes more and more ubiquitous and more and more, you know, powerful, um, I think it's important that we remember, okay, but we have this tactile element. We have this mm -hmm. density of, you know, pigment and density and, you know, and texture. That and we I'm kind of, I'm kind of looking at that as, you know, the frosting or the glitter, that's that thick paint's the very, very last thing I'm doing. And it's, um, yeah, maybe that's how I do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just as yeah, the hot. If you put this on early, then you're wrestling with it the whole time. You're, yeah. you're you know, it just gets everywhere. It just, yeah. You know, can't, it, gotta, gotta, make your, gotta make your cake before you add the frosting. So, yeah. 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 Dale, on the, birch tree mm -hmm. um, when you're fighting with the laziness um, you mm -hmm. know those old nasty brushes with just a couple things sticking up if you just dip that in a tiny little bit of, of paint and just touch it just a little bit you get a you get a better mm -hmm. lacy feel uh, do you understand what I mean Yep, I do. And I tried doing that with the um, lighter, whiter paint, which is where the texture came from. And yeah. I just kept um, muddying it up. Yeah. I, could, okay. I could not get the distinction I wanted. So that would be the difference in what Cheryl just said, which is good advice, but I would change one element. You said dip it into a little pile. I would dip, dip it into a big pile of paint. Actually, get it to load up a little bit, which I can see. Like, I mean, this one's literally casting a shadow. Mm -hmm. So I can see that you're doing that. Um, and it just it ends thing. up a big glob instead of lacy, though. To me, those are big globs of paint instead so, of lacy. Paint. Yeah, but what you want to do is you want to probably mix this color so it's not so bright. You want to probably, excuse me. Um, probably going to be three of the usually the threes. Um, you want to make a color that's not as bright, probably, as here. Okay. But you might have to remix that color just a little bit to subdue it on the edges, unless mm -hmm. to really have that punch. But you can see how almost distracting having that super punch yep. right next to the edges. But um, now that it's dry, your really light color might show up more like you like it yeah it looked better i mean it looked better today than it did um when it was wet you're right oh, interesting so, and i went back and forth on those lacy on the left hand side um putting in blue and wiping it you know going back and forth multiple times trying to break that up and i just couldn't get to where i wanted to go with it yeah that's the hard part about once it gets thick Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wiped yeah. it off and put it back and wiped it off and put it back and Good. Um, anyway so that was the yeah. most challenging as far as like you see this branch how it ends right here it's so close to the, the edge well, I would just take that right off the edge yeah and that and there was masking tape all the way around it so um, you know I painted over the masking tape obviously in a lot of places yeah, Those are just nice itty bitty. They're they're like five by four or something like that, or four and a half. So they're teeny tiny. Yeah, and the main thing is for me is I just love all these earthy, realistic, you know, variations of green. That you've got this grayish. I don't even hardly know how to explain it. Again, I just love the ish colors. You know, greenish, gray. Mm -hmm. Uh, dullish, you've got the warmish, you know, brownish, yellowish, orangish colors, you've got the, you know, the more green, but more olivey green, and then you have the real light green, so nice job, I mean, they're all very realistic, nothing's too high chroma, 
nothing looks like you know green out of a tube. Nice job. They were all mixed, so beautiful. Any feedback, you guys? They're beautiful. Thank you. All I right. think they're Kristen Horn, are you here with us? Yes, she is. She's muted. Let's see. There you go. There you are. Okay, great. Tell us a little bit about this guy here. Um, it was a quick study with the uh, the palette you gave Linda. I thought that sounded uh, interesting because I don't like phthalo green. It's a magnet. Every, every time I've ever painted with it, it ends up all over me and it doesn't want to come off. I do, yeah. you know, So I don't paint with it. So it sounded like a challenge I could get behind. So I did. And look how I would not guess you use phthalo green in here. I mean, all these colors are so right. earthy and yeah, you did a great job. It's beautiful. I love it. Yeah it's, yeah, it's it was just a little. Uh, it was very quick, and it, I wanted to see what I could do with that palette more than anything. And um, this was a um, this was a photo that uh, I had taken. Uh, Don and I had done a uh, paint out for a weekend at Hancock Station uh, over in Clerno um, district of uh, the fossil beds, and oh. If anybody ever gets an opportunity to do that paint out in the spring, it is so much fun. Mm, who's that through? It's through Donna. Help me out. It's um, an air artist of Oregon. Plenaire, and they're mostly in Central Oregon. Uh, I didn't find them to be spread out very much at all. But this is one they do this. Uh, they uh, do this every year. And um, you go, uh, it costs just, just the amount that Hancock Station charges per person. And you stay in the cabins at Hancock Station and it's primitive. It's, they're, they're really made for kids camps, you know. And so you're sleeping on a, on a big bunk bed in little cabins and uh, Don and I had a uh, cabin of ourselves that slept eight so we got to spread out and um, this was a little trail that went up behind the cabins and um, uh, and people would go out and hike the trails and there were fossil beds everywhere and um, and they they would leave during the day and go different places over there and paint. And uh, uh, your food was um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner was provided on Saturday and breakfast and lunch on Sunday. And everybody just brought their own little picnic for Friday night and a bottle of wine or, you know, they had water and things there. And uh, it was just, it was great fun. That's wow. awesome. A quick question for you. You probably already know. It's my same question I ask for everybody. Where, mm -hmm. where, where is your light source? Yeah. She's got Excuse me? Where is your light source? Um, I'm trying to think on this one. We were, I believe it was um, coming back from the, it was behind it. Okay. Yeah, because the shadows, you know, underneath look like it's basically top lit. Yeah, it was close to top lit. Okay. It was, it, it was a little little behind and top. Okay. Yeah, I love the fact that you use that very odd palette. I've been playing with that. In fact, the wave painting that I'll share with you guys, I did with that same palette. Um, except for I think I used a stronger yellow, a cleaner yellow than the yellow ochre. Uh, just because I wanted a little more vibrancy in the foam. But um, but yeah, what a fun palette that is. Um, I don't I literally don't know where that popped into my head, but I'm glad you did it. And I what this really proves to me, your your beautiful little painting here, is that it does subdue that halo green. It makes uh, mm -hmm. it really does an interesting job of making uh, ungodly nearly toxic color almost cartoony in my opinion mm -hmm. uh, controllable and it gives it a lot of 
a lot of variety and a lot of, um, yeah, it can do a lot. So that's really interesting. So I appreciate you doing that experiment. Yeah, I I am I appreciated it as well. Although the color that got all over my skin and my uh, clothes, it was thalo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. That, that's okay. Quinacridone and thalo green are a great marriage. I really love those colors together. And you can make purples, pink. You can make all kind of colors from that. Yeah, it is. It's so wild. Nice job, Kristen. Thank you. All righty, Linda. You again. You go in streaks where all of a sudden one week you don't turn in anything and then the next week you turn in four paintings. I know. All right. that, which, one, which one would you like to talk about? The one that I copied from you or the one with the that one. That oh, one. It's nice. It's yeah. beautiful. Yes. I know. Look at those gray blues. I know you said that they're not um, sage. But they really have that. I'm sure all the, a lot of the desert plants that share that kind of silver, gray, blue. That is sage the right word? Is that what I'm thinking of? Sage is more of a bright green, kind of a mid green color right now. But that's the one that you burn in a thing to. Like oh, that's mesquite. Better. Mesquite. Oh no, 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 no! The one you put like uh, a bunch of it, and then you burn and walk around your house. That's sage. Yeah, that's sage. That's okay. Oh, white sage. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if the sage is a different color because in Oregon it always seems to be this silvery gray blue. It, it is a silver. It is a silvery blue, but it but that's that's a kind of a thorny bush when you look at it and then you touch it. It's um uh, the leaves are very fine. I just made it look bunchy to. Yeah, no, that's good. It's, keep it that's simple. a beautiful painting. Yeah, thank you. It yeah, really is. Tonal yeah, I, beautiful tonalism. Yeah, it's that's beautiful. beautiful. That's yeah, nice. it's tonalism, but at the same time, it's so colorful. Like, mm -hmm. but it is, it's got mm -hmm. a very muted, kind of very atmospheric. Yeah, I, I really think this is one of my favorite paintings you've done. Yeah. And I probably, you know, and I know that it's probably one of the fastest you've ever done. So I'm not I'm saying that your faster paintings are better, but mm -hmm. I think it's that you didn't overthink too much. I think that I, for a little while, Linda, I would like you to paint from photos. I think that you're making up so much in your paintings that I think for a little while, I think you're going to learn a lot by actually just looking at photos of and just, you know, not copying them because I know you cleaned it up and you did a lot of changes. But um, I think like I even saw the one of the uh, trees rib cage here. Like this feels more like one of your made up ones. And I see what happens is you get very rhythmic and very repetitive in your shapes. Yeah. But and um came from my wonderful. But this, they don't, is, they, go ahead. this is called Oak Alley in Louisiana. Okay. It's an oak alley, and these are great big, huge trunks on these trees, and the white, the the light between them is just like outside light because they form this dense canopy and that's mm -hmm. that's what i was trying yeah, to they do and and they're really mm -hmm. thick so they're they're huge like four and five feet around mm -hmm. like through the middle if you cut it down and measured it it would sometimes be three to five mm -hmm. feet or more they're so one like that in savannah too yeah yeah and and i was just some somebody asked me to do a um a painting for them <laughs> And then she changed her mind. So it was Oak Alley. She wanted this Oak Alley with uh, a bench, like uh, um, a bench to sit on, just to think of her mother, because her mother loved these kind of trees. But I never painted it because she found a thirty dollar painting in a in some kind of sale in a some kind of shop in her town. She's in Oklahoma, but we grew up together. So I never got to paint it. So I I painted that just kind of because I'm homesick for springtime in Louisiana. You know? And it's not meant to be pretty or anything. It's, it was just, it's just a soul essence of the trees and the limbs, how they hang over and they form this dense canopy and there's very little light coming through. But I just wanted you to, I see what you're saying about the repetitive, but 
but the picture, I didn't post the photograph I, I kind of looked at, but I didn't look at anything. I do better when I don't, when I look at something and then don't look at it. Right, me too. And that's what I did when I painted that just in last Thursday. I did that probably in an hour. I did that yeah. painting in an hour. Wow. Yeah, while we were here. Yeah, yeah exactly. You did that while we were here. We were all watching and rooting you on. That was a lot of fun to mm -hmm. watch you start it and finish it. And then I told you to stop. Do another one. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, that's a beautiful painting, Linda. That's one of your best ever. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to this one. I understand all the things you're saying. Yeah. And I respect it and I like it. And it has this nice feel. The part that I don't love is that your trees are all, yes, I know that they make this canopy, but I guarantee that the trees aren't all turning like this. And they're not, so you're, 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 um, I thought that was a cave. You're conflating the light with the tree shape. So this is the light, but it would be hitting this tree, not completely cutting it. You see how this shape is really odd here, this dark? Yeah. So it's thicker at the top and then gets thinner. And I do know that oak trees, you know, branch out and get really thick. Yeah. But I would like to see the whole base of it, you know, the yeah. whole trunk. But it's being affected by light. So yes, this left side of the trunk is catching light, but it's not, you know, completely disappearing in that way. Okay. I see. So you see how it looks like it literally creates a C shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was I was in a rhythm. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and you can feel the rhythm. I mean, this almost has a musicality to it. Um, it's got a funky beat and you dance to it. I know. Yeah. It's ja a little jazzy bluesy. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And I don't want, you know, ever to talk you out of doing your more um serene that's the right word, but they're more you know, kind of. It's, almost like it's, spiritual in a way. It's, right? it's a surreal image of yeah, surreal. my heart and walking under those. I've been there. I've been to that plantation and it's just so beautiful. It's It just transforms you to another place. Uh, I love that kind of stuff. I love, yeah, love walking through tree canopies and seeing the light at the end and all that. So yeah, I, I, I respect it, but I, I definitely get distracted by elements in it that I don't think you want to be distracted. Right. I agree. And Great. and this one, this one I did that. I started that one after I did the the one like uh, you that one too. Yeah. Wow. From the same palette. I just did that from the same palette. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wow. Amazing. That is so vibrant. Like I would guess these are, you know. Wow, that's so, I, man, this palette has so much potential. I'm like excited to keep playing with it. I love the mist uh, that sort of goes, you know, in between the trees and the mountains there. There's like a soft mist, isn't that? It's a, yeah, it's called dust out here. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Gorgeous. It's, it's yeah. dusty and it's it's hazy in the morning when it when there's dew on the ground it's actually a foggy mist at the base mm -hmm. of the mountains but at you know in the evenings it's like it's dust because mm -hmm. the farmers are all plowing around them you know in front of the mountains we have mountains all around us and the farmers are all all in between between me and the mountains and uh, they create a lot of dust in their atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's great. Thank you. Same palette. I love it. I love that palette. I have to do something else with that palette. Yeah, I, I think you've found your um mojo here. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you know what I found that was so interesting? There was no burnt umber in any of this. Yeah. It's just mm -hmm. like dark and blue. Nothing on my palette got hard and stiff. Nothing. Yeah, so I'm looking at your photos really quickly, and like you have so many cool photos, and you see how messy. Yeah, like, you're, you you know you uh you're making your paths so clean and pristine. I actually like the messiness and the realness of it. Okay. You know, you can definitely cut down the you know the oh, power yeah. lines, and you know we can say it's before you know oh, we and look overly at did it, but. Like you have so many scenes that just have this rusticness and beauty to them. 
um, I'm always curious, like, why aren't you painting from your beautiful, beautiful photos more? I don't know. I think I'm afraid to mess it up. Seriously. So you go through and you're like, yeah, I probably wouldn't put, you know, like the, um, you know, these three, you know, squares in there and, you know, I might change things, but I still love like the, the authenticity. Yeah. You know, all these irregular shapes and, uh, you know, again, I might not put the buildings, but a lot of my friends would and they'd make them, you know, wonderful. This is like that line that we were talking about with the rock wall with Donna's picture. Like I would probably break this up a little bit, you know, right. but you know, I, I think that you have so many great images that, you know, you might combine them, you might, you know, do whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I think that you, um, I mean, this is, I think this is that scene, just different yeah. time of day. Um, I love that. That's I, I think that you are overthinking. And I think at this stage in your um, painting growth, Linda, that I would, I mean, golly, look at these colors back here. I would urge you to, um, I mean, this one is so good. Yeah, I love that. Thing. Um, you know, there's this straight line. I don't know if that's a berm or whatever here. You know, there's yeah. things that, oh, no, it's a wall, right? It's a wall, yeah. Yeah, there's things that I would change or just uh, de-emphasize. Yeah, leave out. <laughs> yeah, or just, yeah, or just leave, let them be more brushy and stuff. Yeah. But I think that, and again, let me know if I'm overstepping here or if oh. I'm hurting your feelings or if I'm oh. like, but Mike, that's not what I want to do. That's not the growth. I want to go towards, but I think if you just did a bunch of these as even oh, God. 45 minute practices, yeah. Th that this you would... sunrise, sunrise, <laughs> right before so your assignment, should you decide to accept? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, really? Even... God, it's it impossible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, why is that impossible? It's just, it was... It's not impossible. Look at the sit model. down with a with a particular size and play with it. I can't play, but you can. <laughs> it's possible for Cheryl, but the rest of you are being cowards. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, try to get more playful, and you know, it's just it's just a personality trait I have to make everything neat. And if you looked at my house, if you walked in here, you would go, "Man, you do not have that personality trait." <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have any room to put this stuff. My house is small, so if it was a place that I look at the color in there, I love that. What I want you to do, Linda. For if, if again, if if I'm, you know, you could totally just say, I hear you, Mike, but not what I'm interested in, not the direction I want to go. I would love to paint this as while thinking abstraction, abstraction, abstraction. You know, what are yeah. just the big dark shapes? I mean, this this bluey green next to this pinky orange color next to this purple, next to these dirty, you know, earthy greens is glorious. You know, I probably wouldn't do it exactly like this layout, but there's so much here that I think that you're, I don't know how to say it without sounding weird or. No, just say it. I don't. Like, but I'm not positive even how to say it. I would just, I would urge you to do 30 to minutes to one hour paintings. I might even urge you to do, to count your brush strokes. Like I was showing you guys last week, my 30 um, brushstroke mm -hmm. paintings. I would love to even show you guys if we have time, maybe next week, maybe do like something like this, where it's very vibrant, and very exciting. And how could I do this in 15 minutes with 30 brushstrokes, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna be perfection. It's not gonna be super tight and rendery, but I think that just for your growth, because then once you kind of are able to capitalize on a lot of these subtleties, then when you come back in with your innate poetry and your personality, then you're gonna have more tools to express yourself. Yeah. Right now, I feel like maybe your paintings that you mm -hmm. aspire to, 
and the skills that you have are in conflict with each other a little bit. Oh, I love that picture. I like that. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm going to save this one. This one I would love to do. You can do it. Anybody, you guys mm -hmm. can take from them. And those, yeah. those wooden things, those those flat, those, um actually, what do you call those? Those, those boards, they're going to get wrapped in concrete, fabric dipped in concrete, and I'm going to paint on them. And I'm trying to make a wall between me and my neighbor. And it's going to be ugly in the landscape, but I'll go walk around behind it. <laughs> I'll have 50 feet or more to walk behind it. Great. These photos are so good. Yeah, they are. You have Thank so much. I mean, Those you are gorgeous. you're giving such a gift to all of us by the fact that you wake up, you go out, you witness this ever-changing, constantly changing thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I grab a lot of your different skies, you know, and I'll put them into a Pacific Northwest scene. I mean, sheesh. So I feel like, yes, um, let's go for naturalism with you for a little bit, Linda, if you're willing. I'm I know sure, I can yes. do a challenge by changing up your whole color. Okay. But I see so much potential in what you're doing, and I think that there's some kind of an innate conflict um, so yeah, I would love you to lean towards naturalism for a little while. Okay. That sounds good. It's, and that probably goes for a couple of you. It's freeing um, to hear you tell me to do that because then I strive to do that. And otherwise, if I paint and just, you know, I want to make the bush really nice. I want to make it cute. Oh, blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah. I want to. I wanted to conform to some reality that somebody else has mentioned. But look at the top of the mountains; how the colors are all different on the top of the mountains. Every one of them. Yeah. What I think, and again, I I think that you and I are similar in so many ways. What is that? We both suffer from what I call the, and I've said this before, the English gardener syndrome. Yeah. Where, you know, if we had three, three, or you know, a bunch of um, cactuses, we're going to put them right in a row. We're going to make them the same size. We're going to, you know, what I mean. We're going to organize nature, which is useful to a degree, but really letting wilderness be wild. Linda, these are so good. I mean, just the abstraction and the interesting. You know, you got all these horizontals. You've got diagonals. You've got verticals. You've got more diagonals. There's so much interesting things going on. Um, yeah. Anyways, hopefully that's useful to all of you guys. I'm not only speaking to Linda, of course. Um, yeah, boy. All right. I could get lost. And there was the coyote <laughs> in the yard. Yeah, I saw him. <laughs> Look at him. In the yard. In my mouth. <laughs> But my husband opened the gate and put the pan of food there and he came in. Or is that a fox? That's a fox. fox. So yeah. neat to be so that you have animals like that close to home. Yeah. No and skydivers, we you know, it just um well, but yeah, I love looking through other people's photos because you know Linda's out there capturing different things than I would capture. And it's just neat and it's, you know, a different environment. It's just fun to see these different colors. And then even for me, like, look at this subtle, subtle transition up to the top of the sky. Like, what the heck color is this? A touch, right? a touch of Indian yellow a speck, or maybe a touch of yellow ochre and a touch of uh, quinacridone red. But it, it gets greener up here than down here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just all these interesting questions of like, how would I? What could I? Um, boy, all right. I gotta go away, Linda. Too much. <laughs> cool. Nice job, Linda. My facsimile of the desert. <laughs> all you. right. Very nice. Lisa, I think we talked about yours last week here. That's basically saying that if you could kind of come back behind the clouds and darken them, so we could see them a little bit better. A great job. I love the cool light, the warm light, um, everything else. Uh, what are you working on or going to be working on Lisa for the next project? Oh, you said that, the, the painting of mine. Yeah, boy. <laughs> great. Any questions at all, Lisa, while we're going forward? 
No, I just didn't have enough of a block of time to go in and because no, yeah. I didn't. I just knew I would start fussing with it, and then I'd be really frustrated if I had to leave and it wasn't done. So, um, yeah. Nope. I appreciate what you're doing for your community, and uh, I look forward to working on you with this final project. Yeah, me too. Um, I do have one question with putting the blue. Uh, well, putting the sky in, would would the color blue shift with the warm light cool light uh, or i mean can the sky be any color no matter what? yeah it's more of just a a, a value change okay. so i mean you could put gray you could put whatever you know sure. probably just okay. a blue color yeah i mean it would of course change slightly because it's different angles of light but i i wouldn't fuss with okay. it too much it's cool. just for you, just for you okay thank you all right, uh, Lorianne and Martha, um, haven't talked to either of you too much uh, lately. How are you doing, Martha? So you said I'm doing well. Time, you're having a hard time posting the Padlet, so right. If you want help with that this afternoon? Um, do you have the initial email from me? The initial one that said that has the Padlet link. Yeah, because I think. Maybe what I need to do is I'm just going to invite you. Can I get your email address really quick, Martha? Sure. It's Clark Pouch at Comcast.net. So this should send you an email, which may make it easier. Oh, it's saying it's not Clark Couch at Comcast.net. Yes. Oh, it says you are invited. So yeah, you should be able to, um, yeah, anyways, let's talk if you do need help, um, but I'm not, yeah, anyways, I don't wanna spend the class time on that. So yeah, we'll get that figured out, we'll get you in. And I look forward to, and if you, if we have any big hassles, uh, Martha, you can email it to me and then I can drop it in there for you. I've done that for students in the past that for whatever reason, I don't know, Maybe it's like um, the protections on their computer or something. I have no idea. Anyways, we'll okay. figure out work around. And um, is Lorianne here at all? I think maybe Lorianne only signed up for the first couple of classes. All right. Um, Meg, are you here today? Hello. Where are you, Meg? I'm trying to find you. There you are. Hi. How are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? <laughs> Great. I actually um, started a painting based on one of the photos that you shared with me of the really bright pink moon showing up or sun showing up through the gray purple sky. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you got going on here. This would be chaos to paint. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> There's a lot of texture. Yeah, I just, when I, I'm wandering around at night and especially a full moon, it's just, it's always so pretty and bright. So I just like the pattern. So I take a picture. It to really is neat. Yeah, what I would do if, if I wanted to do something like this, which, you know, it's very beautiful. It's just the importance of squinting your eyes. And that kind of helps link different things. Like, like it links values a little bit. So it wouldn't yeah. be quite so busy. And then if you wanted to get in there and really make it, you know, get all those interesting textures. But yeah, that's a wonderful and interesting, beautiful, borderline scary Halloween image. <laughs> yeah, that was at like 1030 at night. All right, so here's your reference that you want to work from for this one. And in here, it looks very, very dark, like a lot of black. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that your reference has a little more light kind of enveloping and getting into some of these things. Uh, yeah, I kind of, I put it on um, Photoshop elements and yeah. then I, like, I play around with it and I'll put different filters on it where it kind of breaks down shapes and, and colors and I print out a bunch of different ones and I start looking at all of them, <laughs> which is really messy. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I do. Yeah, I'll have a black and white. Yeah, just like you're doing. Um, yeah, I'll do a, you know, almost posterized one that helps me kind of do what you're doing. That's you're on that next step. And then you'll use this one to kind of break it up and start uh, bringing in the 
detail and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, the trunk of this is fatter. Different. So it's <laughs> yeah, this one's so wide. Yeah, it's one of the stylized filters, and I kind of liked that because there okay. is so I just figured I'd play with it, and then if I don't, I'll just paint over it. <laughs> Yeah, it feels so wide. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that where I used to live, there was these, um, I think they were super old apple trees That's where they I mean. would just literally chop the tops of them and then they would, you know, shoot up all these branches. So it looked weird. It'd be like a stump with, a, you know, all these branches coming up out of it. Um, I think poplar trees, not poplar trees. Uh, I'm thinking of Harry Potter, the Whomping Willow. What are those kind of trees? Um, the willow trees, anyway, just see that too, where it all of a sudden has like a knot at the top because it looks like it was uh, chopped and then all these little branches grew out of it. Um, whereas this one feels a little more, you know, Sleep. appropriate. I think you might want to maybe darken this area and keep it a little, you know, because right now it just goes thick, 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 all of a sudden, you know, octopus arms. <laughs> um, They're kind of even where they come out. They all come out the same place. You could take it like they were cut differently. Yeah, I would, I think, just darken this spot. So then it has a little more of a, you know, it goes thicker, you know, thicker to thin, not just thick to stop, and then a bunch of thinner ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something about it that doesn't quite feel natural in this state. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's just, um, tell me, okay, so yeah, tell me a little bit about this scene and uh, what your hopes and dreams and aspirations are for it. Uh, my hopes are just to screw up as much as possible. Okay, great, fantastic. <laughs> Um, but since we were doing greens, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to start my canvas, um, completely in quinacrine and red? Yeah. And so I, I painted it in a, in a kind of a watered down thin red. And then I hoped that that would help kind of balance out some of the greens as I was painting them and maybe come out a bit. I don't know. I was just as experimenting because I mean, I have nothing to lose. Um, and then, um, yeah, I just hope to just see what happens, I guess. I mean, <laughs> this is, I'm not treating it very precious. So I just Good. To just mess around, really. No, that's, I mean, um, in one of the uh, other classes, I posted a sign that I have had up in my studio in the past is every painting is an experiment and we can't fail an experiment. All we can do is learn. Yes. And I believe that about all my paintings, sometimes they hurt my feelings more than others. Um, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm not sure if it was in this class or in one of my um, painting groups that, you know, like we're all professionals and stuff and we meet up once or twice a week and talk. And um, <clears throat> we were talking about the difference between practice and performance art. And um, that most of the art I create, I kind of think of as practice, even when I want it to be more refined and I'm, you know, hoping that it'll be good enough to put into a gallery, because again, I have to make money, I have to, you know, what I do, but most of it's practice, because I'm experimenting, I'm trying, you know, I'm constantly asking new questions, you know, is it about a palette, is it about brushwork, is it about texture, whatever it is. Um, but then there are times, you know, like commissions or different things where I say, now it's performance. Now I'm not practicing, I'm not pushing, I'm not challenging myself. I'm doing what I know. And again, I think maybe I talked about this in class. I equate it to, you know, somebody learning piano and then having to get up and get on stage and give, you know, a recital. Right? That's not the time to be practicing anymore. Once you get on that stage and you gotta, you know, make sure your parents feel like they're all the money's been worth it. You gotta perform. Um, but I hope that, you know, especially for I, I would say for all of you guys, for 90% of the time, I want you to be in the practice mindset. I want you to be in that scientist. You know, you can't fail an experiment. All you can do is learn, and learning is winning. Um, 
So great. I am super proud. I'm, you're saying all the right mm -hmm. things. Even if the painting's a tiny bit, you know, awkward at this stage, I'm really happy with what you're doing and uh, with the challenges that you're setting forth and that you're experimenting and playing and trying things. Um, paintings just can't be too dear. And you're saying all the right stuff. So I appreciate that. Yeah, well, that's what made me not um, paint from on my own and not doing step-by-step -step tutorials because everything I felt had to be a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now I'm just trying to lose that and really try to be um, messy. Yeah, I'm going to take a poll when we, uh, before we go on break, and I bet you, you are not wrong. I bet you, you and every single other person in this class has felt that way and that it's such a hindrance to painting because the only way we learn is by painting and the only way we learn is by being brave and experimenting and being willing to I, I hate to use the word fail but you know have it less than successful but we learn more from those paintings than we do from our successes especially when they're an accidental success hmm. So great job. Um, any questions for me going forward? Oh, and I wanted to say about painting the red background. Yeah, so a lot of times painters will do where they'll put the contrasting color. So green and red are opposites on the color wheel. So when you put that opposite color, you'll create this vibrancy and electricity in your painting. The only hard part about it is it's really hard to observe the color, especially in the beginning. When you first started putting on the greens, I bet they felt really weird putting them on those reds. And it's not until you get it mostly covered that you can begin to analyze those colors. So putting a really strong high chroma color on the base can be fantastic. And a ton of really great painters uh, do that. Um, but it can make it hard to read the colors for a while, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with this stage, I was just trying to find shape and value as much as I could. And I was going to worry about color in the next layer. <laughs> Perfect. No, you say all the right things. Great job. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely. Uh, Michelle's not here, but we've all praised this uh, color wheel, color tree, color, whatever you want to call it. it was so ingenious. Love it, Michelle. I've literally copied this. And uh, if I don't re, you know, steal your idea and redo it, I will probably be using this as an example in future classes because I just think it's so good. Isn't that neat how she just got them all in these different bands? And, yeah. and I, I, I can learn so much by just looking at this. So. Michelle is so smart. I love her. Yes, she is. Clever, clever lady. All right, Nyla, is this your painting? Yes. Holy crap, I thought it was the photo reference. When it's small, I just literally thought that Wonderful. was the Oh my well, God. I was going to tell you what was wrong with it. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Besides nothing, what's wrong with it? Well, you know, when I printed it off, um, it had a lot more yellowish look to it. And after I posted it, I went back to look at the reference photo and I thought, Oh no, because the reference photo was so, you know, much more subdued, I think, than what I've got. Uh, but, um, gorgeous. I, I also intended to go back and uh, straighten out my little um, back bank a little bit better because you know me and my wiggly lines. And, yeah, that's much um, better. <laughs> and I thought I would put I intended to go back and where I've got the larger sky holes, put some thin branches, and I forgot to do that. But um, I was yeah, thinking you I may have overthought the, yeah. the top, but the bottom, I just went totally relaxed. I held my brush like a wand, and I just played, and um, very, the bottom part of it's very relaxed. It's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, all I would like to see, and again, I know this is a regional stylistic thing. I've got relatives who live, you know, are from your part of the world, and Bye. they literally are constantly like, what's up with your soft edges? What's up with your, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they love this style. And when they show me, you know, pictures of all the art in the restaurants and everything, it's very much 
this tight rendery style. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to tell you, you know, it'll be better if you soften edges or anything. So that's just a stylistic choice. Mm -hmm. um, man, yeah, this is seriously the thumbnail. I really, really thought you had just reposted, you know, the mm -hmm. reference with like you just doctored the colors a little bit. So I actually like your version better than the reference um, wherever it is because you've got more, uh, you've got a lot of greens in here. I bet you if we were able to separate out all these greens, I bet you've got 20 different greens easy mm -hmm. in here. Well, really? I was trying to do a lot of different grains because I thought, you know, here we've got this study in grains. I'm going to just mm -hmm. go wild with making grains. You should have seen all my little piles. I had my mother piles and then I had my babies from the mother piles and um, I had fun. I had a lot of fun doing it. I'm, 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 th I'm thrilled by this day. You did such a nice job. You did the, Beautiful. you went above and beyond. I mean, you've got all the colors. You've got this great thing. And again, like any things that I would say that I would do differently, again, that's just because I'm a different painter. I come from a different lineage. I, you know, I'm inspired by different artists. You know, I love the impressionists a little more. I love the tonalists. Um, you come from, you know, it looks like, yeah, a little more rendered, a little more, I don't know if you want to call it photographic or whatever, because it's still stylized. It's lovely. I really don't have much feedback besides personal, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would like to, so here's a good example. You see, we know that this tree is thinner, right? It's not full like this tree is. Right. What you may want to do instead of keeping that same value all the way through is where it gets thinner, you almost want to invite a little bit of that color from the sky into that mm -hmm. and combine the two. You have it on the edge of this. And that will soften this and be a little bit more like how we see. So um, before you know spring fully hits, we can go outside or look out our window or whatever. And you're going to see some trees are beginning to leaf out and some of them are in between some of them are thinner mm -hmm. and watch what happens to the edges on the thinner trees is that there's um yes yeah, you've got it in certain areas but look for that change in color and value as it goes out towards the thin edges and mm -hmm. oftentimes what it's doing is bringing in some of the light color the light color of the light and mm -hmm. also the sky color behind it. And I found, because I all, I had such a hard time, especially on thin spindly trees, until I realized, oh, the branches just aren't as dark. Like this really dark arch branch here mm -hmm. and how out of place it looks. Yeah. Um, but man, I'm, I'm really having to like stare at this painting to be able to um, find things that aren't just fantastic. Well, thank you. And look, look at the, the haze on the water, that green duckweed or whatever reflections. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Oh, look at this. That, that's gorgeous. <clears throat> I love you so I can't, you've made it so I can't paint for my own reference. Now I have to like do better than this. This is so good. Nice job, Mara. That's your best painting. So Thank yeah, you so I know. You just, uh, there was one you did a couple weeks ago that I was just like, I'm thinking, yeah, like this one. That one. Oh, I love this. That was like, gorgeous. Yeah I, think, yeah, I love the warm and cool light, but uh, boy. Fantastic. All right, Nyla, we got to get your art and some frames and get you out there. That's <laughs> Nice job, Nyla. Good. Thank you. All righty. Um, Renee, did we talk about this pair? Were you, is Renee here? I know a couple people sent me emails that they weren't able to make it today. Um, I, did we talk about this pair last week? I think so. But, you know, it's such a gorgeous pair. It really is. I mean, it truly looks like a golden pair. And what I really like you know, I'm not going to spend too much time, but I love the soft gradation. If this was a waxy apple, right, the highlight would be really tight and uh, much like a spotlight. But when you have things that aren't waxy, 
that light is diffuse and you can see these gradient changes as it goes out and gets darker. So good. And then what I love is we've got kind of a light, bright, warm light. And then um, Renee did such a great job of having this cool, soft, almost reflect, uh, I don't know what, but background. Reflected light. light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it just really creates this roundness and softness to this. I mean, it is a beautiful painting. This, mm -hmm. this, this golden pair, just a pair. <laughs> it's not just a pair, Renee. <laughs> this is beautiful. Um, I, this, this is another one that I think should be framed. It's really nice. It's beautiful. Great. All right. And, and Sandy, I think, said that she's not here this week. Are you here, Sandy? Um, I think we talked about Sandy's painting last week. Really great. Um, nice job. Love the backlit clouds. All right, Sharon. You said to be what I wanted to. So yeah, you. good. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you wanted to paint. Well, that's a, I believe, a, it was a picture from a book, and it's a motion picture, I think, and the clouds are um, on the ocean, showing up on the ocean, and um, the yellow, the sky is dark, which is stormy, with mm -hmm. light showing through, and I don't know what else to say. I just like the picture. Yeah, very cool. Can I ask what's going on here? Is this the ocean part of it? That's the ocean part of it. I mean, Okay, so what are all these shapes? Is it a reflection of the clouds? A reflection of the clouds, I guess. So it's a super smooth ocean? Pardon? So the ocean's very, very, very smooth? I don't know. Let me show you the picture. You tell me. All right, let me do a stop share. So Give me a second it. to find it again. Can you see the picture? Yep. Give me one second. I'm going to spotlight you so we can all see it. Give me. Keep going. Keep going. Where's the spotlight? There we go. Okay. Can you hold it up a tiny bit higher? So I do not think that's the ocean. What do you think it is? Just more clouds. I don't think we see the ocean. Okay. You think it's more clouds? Yeah, I think it's two layers of clouds, which actually is what your painting looks like more. Can you hold it up one more time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're up like on a cliff mountain looking kind of down okay. and across. Can you hold it just a little lower? Yeah, that's more cloud. Okay, good. I've got some ideas for you, Sharon. Good. Great. Okay, so I'm going to go back to share screen. I hope just got to take the spotlight off you, put it on me. I thought it was ocean, but then I don't know, you know. Does the picture not tell you? No, it just calls it reflection. 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 So maybe I'm wrong. Um, so what I wanted to That's show like it, in your photo versus um, here is, do you see the white line kind of yeah. lower middle? Yeah. It is not nearly that bright in the photo. Uh, okay. Um, so it'll be a little darker. And what happens to Sharon is when we bring in just white on top to lighten things, until we bring in some color, uh, it gets cool. So you have this warm light, but then as the as you bring in the white, it gets cooler, and um, yeah, so it kind of breaks it up a little bit. Um, I, I really do like so much of what you got going on. You got this nice form. It's a backlit, um, this big dark shape. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting reference that you chose because I, I kind of don't even understand maybe did you guys understand what you were seeing there very well oops I muted you Cheryl sorry not really yeah it so, just uh, reminded me of two layers of clouds when you're very high on the mountains and you you look out and then there's kind of a softer layer and you see the lower layer of cloud almost like when you look out of a airplane okay. yeah that's kind of what i felt like yeah um 
So I'm not sure what the reflection part in the description, if it's just reflecting light or whatever. Um, anyways, painting what you like, I applaud that, Sharon. Um, and I think that you've learned a lot in this, that you know, you've got nice form, nice structure in your clouds. You've got these interesting gradients of color and temperature. Um, this is going to be a comment for everybody. And again, I put myself in this group. Odd photos, like of a really weird tree or a really weird sunset doing a very, very strange thing or a very, very odd cloud formation, often don't make great paintings. So a lot of times, you know, I'll stop and take a photo of something because it's so interesting, it's odd. But it, I found by uh, trying to paint it, if I can't understand or um, tell myself, it, the, the painting off a lot of times looks odd. Whereas a photo gets away with it, a painting doesn't. And I hate to say that because I have so, I have, you know, over all the 20 years of teaching now, I probably have hundreds of examples of students saying, look what this crazy cloud was doing. It made this weird dome on top of a mountain or it did this or it did that. And look how it looks like a UFO. But, um, and um, so, yeah, when we are selecting photos, ask what it is about the photo that you want to capture. And if, if it's because it's odd, because it's, a, you know, it's such a weird thing, it doesn't always translate into painting. It just, does that make sense, you guys? Mm -hmm. Actually, what I liked about that was the colors. Oh, <laughs> the colors. okay. Well, then, yeah, you're doing great on that. Um, and I, I still love it. I still think it's a really good painting. I'm really impressed. Even the shapes down below that I'm not positive I understand what they are, are still showing form. Like, you have a light side, and it gets wraps around to the dark side, like you're doing so, I mean, this cloud up here, you're doing so much of what I hoped for. It is interesting that the assignment was greens and then you chose clouds, um, but that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, Sharon, I always want you to paint whatever it is you want to paint for sure, 100%. Um, I'm just hoping that that's, somewhat useful information um, going forward. The painting is called Light Waves and it's Oregon Coast. So I, I never could figure if that was the ocean where the ocean end and the clouds begin. That's why maybe it's not ocean. I mean, I never even thought about it being anything else, honestly, you know? Yeah. So, but yeah. if you look at the picture, you can't tell where, yeah. if it is ocean, you can't tell where the ocean began ends and the clouds begin. And that's why I painted that light. So there would be a distinction between the two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but it draws attention to the part that you don't know what's going on. Okay. So this you know bright light, this sense. bright light makes me look here. Uh -huh. You know, you start looking here, then you go to the contrast, and then you end up in here because of the contrast again, the dark to the light. Well, I never even thought about those being clouds. That's really strange, you know, just, I really like the picture. I like the colors. Um, yeah. That's all no, I and I get it. And again, I, I want these to be, you know, learning and experimenting and trying things. And you, I definitely can see you doing so many of the things that I'm wanting you to work on, well, all of us to work on which is creating form by having a light, a mid, a dark, a light, a mid, a dark. You're doing it so well. So, yeah, I, I'm not saying that, you know, don't do it. I'm not saying that it's a, you know, not a successful painting. It's just an odd painting because I don't quite understand what I'm looking at. Well, it was an odd picture, actually. How many times do you see green clouds like that? <laughs> <laughs> what, if, what if you did... Um go back and smooth out that area that you think, you know, that you're looking at as ocean and just do like a gradient, a reflection, a reflection of the sky that you're seeing above. Yeah, I will do that. I will change that, you know. And it is. An ocean. 
the space could still be there. It just needs yeah. to be pushed back a little bit, just not as not as stark as it is. Right. Right. Because when you say it's ocean, then I'm like, oh, maybe these are rocks. And then when we think, oh, those are clouds, I'm like, oh, this is a mountain, and we're even yeah. higher than no. this mountain. Like that's what I mean. It's like I kind of don't get it. But again, that doesn't mean anything. Like. You know, I was picking on Linda earlier, who does these really kind of dreamy, you know, borderline spiritual, abstract, you know, things and stuff. People love those. People well, love, you. you know, but in this class, I'm trying to teach you how to um, create well, and you know, represent you, things. Because how else will I learn? What's that? I don't mind that you, if you pick on me, because how else will I learn? Well, and I really like picking on you, so that's great. Hey, <laughs> work on us all. We want to. Don't hurt my feelings, believe me. In any way, uh, I will eventually. I'll figure it out. <laughs> no, no, it is. It's a nice painting. You've got good form. You've got good structure. I love the greens and the different things that you've done. Um, but yeah, it, it it leaves me just wondering what I what it is I'm actually looking at. But maybe in a way that's like a, you know, that could be your secret weapon. It's like, you know, I'd be looking at a wall of paintings and I'd get to yours and I'd be like, what? <laughs> you know, it's paused me in my tracks a little bit. So um, great. Nice job, Sharon. Thank you. And is that the only painting? Because I, I saw you posted quite a few things. I did put the pears work. on there. <laughs> Finally, I got the pears on there. And the the reflections and stuff. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> yeah, great job. Mm -hmm. Looking across them, nice, nice colors, nice shapes. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, I right, am gonna do a stop share. And, oops, my little camera. Where do um, you go? <laughs> bring it back, I guess. Um, and uh, remove spotlight, because I want to do a quick, quick survey. If I can see everybody on the screen really quickly, um, I just going back to what Meg was saying about um, when we are trying to do paintings that um, we expect a certain result or we're following along exactly, right? Who finds that that actually stymies, stymies us from painting? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it yeah. makes it almost not want to paint, myself yeah. included. Um, yeah, I've got some paintings behind me that are behind that ocean wave stuff. And um, so I do want you to do exactly what Sharon just did and make sure you're having fun. Make sure you're trying new things and playing and experimenting. And again, remember the difference between practice or play or experimentation and performance. I expect almost zero performance from you guys, right? We all love it when our paintings turn out, but this class, this time, why you're here, why you're spending money is all about practice, experimentation, and play, okay? So do not let bad paintings hurt your feelings, or do. Set your timer on your phone, on your watch, on your whatever. Give your side five seconds. Push stop, dry your tears, and then look at your painting and go, okay, what did I learn? Mm -hmm. What's going to make the next painting better? Thank the painting. Don't say I wasted time or, you know, I didn't get the gold star that my, that I wanted so badly from Mike or, you know, from Cheryl or, you know, Nyla. You know, again, it's great when Nyla's painting is so beautiful and wonderful and, you know, some other people's, but that's not the goal in this class. The class is to paint. Paint, 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 play, 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 experiment, practice, practice, practice. The performance will come later. But if you're not practicing the piano and learning, you know, how to you know move your fingers, how to hold the brush, how to mix the colors, the performance is never going to be as good. So that performance is in the distance. Right now, it's all about being liberated to just experiment and play and try new things 
you know, Kristen and Linda both tried a whole new palette. Wonderful. We all learned by looking at them. And that's what this class is about, you guys. Absolutely. Of course, you know, when I say really nice things to Nyla or, you know, to other people because their paintings did turn out, that's, that feels good. I get that. We all want that. But it will stymie our growth if that's what we're pursuing and that's what we're looking for. Um, so do pr practice, experiment, fail. Please, please, please. That's what this class is about more than anything. All right, let's take a break. I'm going to set up my uh, palette. I'm going to be doing a wipe away method. Um, you guys said I have not done that in this class. No. Really detailed question for you. You were saying that you're doing a different color combination for a wipe away painting. I did a different color combination. So yeah, uh, two weeks ago, you and I were talking about, because uh, normally I do um, the transparent earth red and um, ultramarine blue. Um, and then you said that you uh, were experimenting with a slightly different color when you were doing the pairs. What was that? Yeah, it's um, my dark is uh, burnt umber ultramarine blue, and I add um, transparent red oxide, which is like okay. a transparent burnt sienna. So you're and getting then, darker darks, and you're getting more dark. opacity. Right, but then when I push, I can push the ultramarine, I can push the transparent red, and I can push the ultramarine, and um, I get a wider range. Okay, but so I'm going to do something similar. Um, I was contemplating putting in the burnt umber. I, I thought that was the colors you and I were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to do, I'm going to throw phthalo green into the mix. Rather than the transparent red or rather than the ultramarine blue? Rather than the ultramarine blue. Ooh, so I do want you guys, you know, here I am saying, be brave, go for it. I'm like saying, be understanding. I'm doing <laughs> practice and play. I'm doing practice and play. So if this gets wild and uncomfortable, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, but I, I normally do my wipe away paintings, um, and I did it for years with transparent earth red and ultramarine blue. The reason being is more of the transparent earth red creates that earthy brown mm -hmm. reddish color, yep. and the ultramarine blue can cool it down. So I can create this transition. Um, I mean, maybe I should just play it safe and do that, but I oh, don't. To, yeah, <laughs> Wait, I don't. Wait, no, I don't. Excited. All right, so I'm going to do. Phthalo green, um, transparent red, and I'm going to put a little bit of Indian yellow uh, as well as my undercolor. In fact, that's probably what I'm going to do is coat my painting, my surface with Indian yellow during this break so that it has a couple of minutes to sink in. I'm going to wipe that back off a little bit so it's not sopping wet. And then I'm going to come across with the phthalo green, transparent earth red. If it's too transparent, then I will add a little bit of the burnt umber into that. And maybe I'll just throw a little bit on the palette just in case. Um, the painting, the image that I'm going to do is the, if you guys want to look at the Padlet page, um, I think I put it on top of the uh, reference photos. This week is about big shapes, the big shape of the tree and experimenting and uh, working with sky holes. And I'll talk about that as we are doing it. Um, I'm just looking at my photo references. Yep, okay, I've got it on the top of photo references, the image I'm going to use. I'm going to crop in a little bit. It won't be so much sky since the assignment is about trees. Um, so the trees will be a little bigger, the sky a little less big. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead. I know it's already almost 12, which, you know, in theory, in a normal class, <laughs> it would only be a half hour left. Uh, I'm just going to pay for what it takes. Uh, I do have a doctor, not a doctor's appointment. I have an appointment uh, meeting at 2.30, so, you know, I got to get off before then, but we'll all be starving and thirsty by then. So. Um, let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. We'll be back just after noon, my time, Pacific Mode, uh, PST. Um, so get up, stretch your legs, pat yourself on the back. You guys are doing amazing. I am so very, very proud of you guys for just doing these crazy things that I keep asking. And I really, I can see the growth in every single one of you guys. Really, I'm so proud of you. All right, see you guys in 10. Thank you, Michael.